Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video we'll be doing a extreme budget office stroke very, very light gaming PC for somewhere in around the £250 mark. Interested? Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so in today's video we'll be taking a look at how to build a super budget PC, which is suitable for home office kind of work, and also some extremely light gaming, but also with a little bit of future proof in built in and for an extreme budget of only £250, give or take a few pence here and there. Now obviously some compromises have been made and sadly the uh, the local business owner who's actually requested this PC is somewhat of a skin flint, so we have had to cut some corners, but we should still be able to make a decent little PC which is gonna have a little bit of longevity and still not cost an absolute fortune. So let's go through and introduce some of the parts. So first of all, the processor. Now the processor is the heart of the machine. This one is a, a slightly slow beating processor. This is the Athlon 3000G. So this is a dual core, four thread processor. It's an extremely cheap option, and it does have a built-in APU, so that means we can take a GPU out of the equation. Of course, at a later date, we can upgrade this because it is on the AM4 platform, so as processors become slightly cheaper or there's other models available, we can certainly upgrade it on the AM4 platform, so it's a really good starting point. And again, we are on an extreme budget. This processor we managed to pick up for about £50, so that's a, a pretty good chunk of our budget already gone. Moving on from that, we got the motherboard. Now, motherboard-wise, this is the Gigabyte A320 M-H. Yes, my friend, this is your time to shine. A lot of you have got quite bent up in the comments about this particular board saying it's trash, and I will defend it to some extent. Now, obviously, this isn't a board that is suitable for everyone, but for a very light, moderate-use gaming PC or a home office setup, that kind of thing, it's absolutely fine. Now, obviously, you wouldn't want to consider putting on a... Ryzen 7, that kind of thing on there. So you do have to temper your expectations, but for pretty much every single APU and for moderate processors up to and including the Ryzen 5 3600, this board is absolutely fine and gets the job done. And we picked it up for an absolute bargain price of just 20 pounds. So yeah, that's a little bit of a saving on the budget. Next, we've got the case. Now the, uh, the person who requested the build actually wanted a PC case with a bit of bling. So we've gone with the first player gaming D3-A, which as you can see is a uh, very interesting design and also has that huge fan on the front and we've got a ton of built-in RGB. So it definitely ticks that box. Also, it's got tremendous airflow. So again, should we wish to upgrade it later on in the future, higher end processor, higher end graphics card, even a newer motherboard, then this case is totally suitable for it. Also, there's a load of room in there for building and it is micro ATX, so it's gonna snugly fit our A320 M board, absolutely fine. RAM wise, we've gone with uh, a slightly obscure choice, but it was uh, a particularly good deal. So we've actually got some G skill. This is their Trident Z range. Now this is DDR4, it's only DDR4 2400. So we're not really gonna get the maximum out of it, but it is a 16 gig kit. And we've put this in the system as being valued at around about 50 pounds. So 50 pounds for 16 gigs of RAM these days, especially RGB and G skill stuff is pretty decent quality. It's actually got a pretty decent low CAS latency as well. So it should feel nice and snappy in use. Again, this PC is primarily for office based tasks. So internet use, email, Outlook, all that kind of stuff. So gaming isn't really a priority. So it doesn't have to be a particularly high frequency in order to take advantage of the APU's cores. And talking of cores, we've got to keep those cores clean. Now the processor actually came as an OEM unit, so we didn't have a cooler. So we've opted for this. This is Freezer's Arctic A13X. Again, absolutely overkill for this particular processor. To be honest with you, you could just put a stick of metal on there and it would probably cool it just fine. But having said that, this is going to be used in a business environment. So we want to keep the thermals in check. We want to keep everything nice and cool. And with the six year warranty on the Arctic Freezer A13X, yeah, that's going to be six years that I'm not going to have to worry about supporting it. Power supply wise, we've gone with something uh, relatively cheap and cheerful. So we've gone with the GameMax GP500. Uh, this is really easy to pick up. You can pick these up in the region of about 25, 30 pounds, depending where you're shopping. Again, absolutely fine. This is a bronze rated power supply. Our total wattage of the system is going to be so low, it's ridiculous. This thing is probably five times the power wattage that we actually need but it's gonna give us a bit of headroom. It's got a couple of PCI Express connectors on there, so should we wish to put a gaming graphics card in at some point? 
then we certainly can do. There's tons of connections and it's a nice reliable unit. Storage wise, we've gone with something um, probably more than what is actually necessary. So we have gone with a NVMe based drive. This is a PCI Express Gen 3 times two drive. 256 gigs, absolutely fine. Again, this is only gonna be used for Windows, Outlook and a few other programs. It's gonna be absolutely fine. Again, because this board has got SATA ports as well, we can of course add another SATA drive if we choose to later on down the line. But again, this is a budget bargain basement PC. And because we're using a slightly slower CPU, this NVMe drive should make Windows feel nice and snappy. So anyway, that's the parts introduced. Let's get on and put this thing together. Okay, so we've got our board ready. I've already put the uh, processor in the socket there. You can see it's the Athlon 3000G, so that is in place, ready to go. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put the NVMe drive in. So the NVMe drive, nice and simple. All we need is a PH1 headed screwdriver, available from the links below if you wanna mic some unboxing one. It's also magnetic, so it picks up the screws nice and easily. And we're gonna install our drive. So this drive is actually uh, an SK Hynix kind of OEM drive. Picked it up for a very good price, so that was happy days. An appropriate drive around about this sort of size of capacity, you're probably looking around about 30, 35 pounds, somewhere in that region. So yeah, it's not, uh, not particularly expensive. Put the drive in and then fasten the screw at the end. Don't do it overly tight just so it's held in place. And that is the, uh, that is the drive installed. So that's that done. Next we can stick in the RAM. RAM, nice and easy to do. So we're just gonna open up the slots there and then we're gonna grab our RAM sticks. Again, so our Trident Z. Nice little RAM sticks, very reliable. And we can stick that into the slot, both sides and firm pressure both sides. And that's in place. And then we'll do the same with the other one. So making sure you line up the notch, which is there with the memory and into the slots it goes and again equal pressure both sides and it snaps into place so that is our trident z rgb installed and our nvme and our processor so let's get on and stick the cooler on next up is going to be the cpu cooler so we need to remove these standard am4 brackets so just loosen those off and then remove the two plastic brackets Next, we've got these four standoff pillars which screw into the AM4 backplate. So we'll go ahead and do that now. Okay, so now we've got the, uh, the pillars in. Next, we can put the brackets on. Now the brackets are a weird one. You'd expect them to go shiny side up because that is the kind of the more pretty way of having it, but they don't, they go upside down. So put them actually onto the screws like that. And then you've got these four little thumb screws which keep everything in place. Again, it's a weird design because the thumb screw, you can't actually really get to the actual, the thumb part of it particularly well because of those little ridges, but the CPU will not attach in any other way. So don't try and fit these upside down, otherwise you'll end up taking it all apart. Once you've got it sort of thumb tight or whatever, go ahead and give it a final lock into position. And you will find if you lift the board up off the deck that the, the back plate is actually loose. So don't be too concerned, but just do put it onto something solid or so you can have a little bit of tension on it and it actually pushes the brackets up so they'll meet up with the screws. So next thing you wanna do is to apply some thermal paste. Uh, we're gonna use Arctix MX4 as we generally tend to, uh, mostly because I picked up a load of it cheap. And we'll put a five to 10 mil little line on the CPU there. That's a little bit more than we need there, but that's absolutely fine. So now we've done the thermal paste, we can now get the cooler ready to install. So there's the cooler, I've taken the, uh, the front off, so literally there's just some clips on the side which hold that in place, so you pop that off. Flat side goes towards the front of the PC, which would be this way, and the kind of chamfered or cut off edges, they go towards the rear where your IO is. So we're gonna match up the springs and the screws there and there with this section here and here. Entirely up to you how you do it. I generally tend to get one of them kind of centered 
and then just drop the processor into place or the cooler into place rather and I think that should just about match up so we'll uh, we'll give it a few screw thread turns on one side just to get it started so about three or four turns there I'll spin it around a little bit more make sure that's lined up it wasn't lined up very well at all That's that started now. So a couple more turns on the uh, the flip side. And just keep on screwing so you can't screw no more. Now we can attach the front cowl. Now in this particular instance, because of where the ram is situated, we actually need to remove the ram again. So let's take those out. And we'll get the cowl. just locks into position so that's pushed in so now we can stick our ram in again and there as you can see with the uh, the cooler shroud installed it's actually pretty darn close to that ram so yeah we would have struggled to get it in without taking the ram out I feel but yep it's all done so all we need to do now is to actually go around to the other side and grab our PWM connector for the fan and just plug that into the header on the end there tuck the cable down and that is essentially it that is basically a working PC right there ladies and gentlemen so let's stick it in a case okay so now it's time to actually get the case ready so we'll take out the uh, thumb screws remove the back panel and then we can remove the glass side panel so that just pulls out and we can lift that off and put it somewhere safe until we need it. So the next part is going to be a little bit of uh, cable management and just working out what is going where. So this is a really simple build so there's not really a great deal going on. We've got our USB 3.0 connector so that can go towards the bottom somewhere. We've got our IO so this is USB and HD audio which seems to be uh, in one strip so we're going to go ahead and split those down a bit so we can route them where we need to. We also got the front IO, so that's a reset switch, power switch, etc. etc. Although the reset switch on this has been repurposed as a LED switch, so that's going into the uh, hub here, which is magnetic. If you want to see a full breakdown of this case and our initial review of it, there is a link up here, as there will be for pretty much all the components that we're using in this build, so feel free to check out any of those. But yeah, this is actually quite handy, the fact it's magnetic, so you can basically do your cable management, work out where things work and where they don't and then just uh, attach it to the case. Sadly, the uh, RGB pass-through on this won't be in use because the motherboard doesn't have any RGB, but it's not a problem because we can just use that reset switch to cycle through the lighting colors, etc. We do have a Molex connector to uh, consider, so we're gonna go ahead and connect that up as well. So I think the first thing to do is to get our power supply installed. So again, this is the GameMax GP500. Actually, not a bad little power supply. You can pick them up pretty cheaply. It's a reasonably reliable unit, it seems. I had a few of them now, so used in quite a few builds and uh, touch wood, not had any complaints so far. Okay, so we've got our power supply in and uh, yeah, there is a visible window on the side here. So I'm not overly keen with seeing all the writing on there. So I think what we'll do is, in this power supply, for this particular instance, also I know that the, uh, the company which is having this PC they are very much into motor racing and things like that, so I think a touch of carbon fibre might be a good idea right here. So let's, uh, let's carbon fibre wrap the power supply. So there's the power supply. Here is our carbon fibre wrap. We've got some which is uh, pretty much cut to shape actually from one I did previously, thanks to Ugly Bob for the carbon fibre wrap. So that is going to be pretty much bang on. It doesn't have to be uh, exact because you can always trim it with a knife after. And this stuff is actually relatively uh, easy to maneuver, etc. Well, there's a little bit of static in there. So we'll try and get the uh, the straightest line, although I don't think there is that many. Uh, let's get that lined up. It doesn't have to be exact because some of it is uh, actually covered up anyway. So. There we go, we'll just spread that out. Try not to get any air bubbles in. You could if you wanted to, you can actually remove the sticker underneath as well, just to uh, make it look a little bit nicer. 
But there we go. I think that is uh, a massive improvement already. Nice little bit of a carbon fibre look. Some angles, you can again, you can still see their sticker underneath it, but that's mostly going to be hidden, I think, for a visual appearance, for straight off. I think that's uh, a slight improvement. So let's stick it back in the case and see what it looks like. So there we go, there is the power supply back in with a little bit of uh, carbon fibre bling. Yeah, I think that looks much better. So let's get on and uh, put some cables in the right places and start the rest of the build. So we've got some of the cables in place at the moment, as you can possibly see from the back there. So next thing to do is to stick in our IO shield. Yep, yeah, sadly this board doesn't have one which is pre-attached, but not to worry. So put it in from the rear and Normally just a little bit of a push in those four corners and it should snap into place. Yep, yeah, there we go. That's in firmly. So now we can stick the motherboard in. Okay, so now we can put the motherboard in. So relatively straightforward task. Just make sure that any of the cables you've already wired through are not in the way. And then just gently lower the board in and then push it towards the back of the IO shield. And then when it's roughly in place, check on the back and see if it's lined up. So with it from another angle, you can see there it just drops into place and just line up your connectors and push it through and that is it. Then you can start screwing up all the screws. So there's six screws on this one. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And then we're pretty much done. So motherboard's in the case now, so we can just pop through some of the extra cables so we've got our main power connector, which is this one up here. Uh, that's pretty straightforward, so we just plug that straight in. Shame the board isn't a little bit wider, really, or there wasn't another hole to actually put that cable through because it is, uh, yeah, is a little bit of an eyesore, but there's not really a great deal we can do about that. Other cable-wise, we've it is top corner. We've got the EPS connector, which is going to be. Uh, it's going to be a little bit traumatic, I think, getting to. I won't give you a camera angle of it because I don't think I'm going to get the camera and my hand in there at the same time. Yeah, there's not going to be a good way of getting this cable in, I don't think. Uh, go on. I think we'll break the cooler. So there we go. We've got the uh, EPS connector up in that top corner. That was a little bit of a struggle. Did uh, get a bit of a sweat on doing that one. But yeah, getting there. So I just got to plug in the rest of the front I.O. connections and a little bit of tweaking on the back and... We're pretty much done. Okay, so we're all done. Everything is connected up and actually, yeah, it's not too bad. It's a, a tidyish little build. The power supply cables, I would have preferred to have not had the ketchup and mustard, but yeah, it is what it is. So I'll give you a little spin round. So you can see inside the uh, monstrosity cable there, but the rest of it, absolutely fine. Very tidy down in that basement section. Everything is nicely hidden away, tucked away. Uh, from the rear, got a nice IO shield in there in chrome. And, uh, at the back here actually not too bad pretty tidy managed to get most of the wires neatly out of the way so we've got the main eps cable there we've got a main power cable and io cables all there and there's still room in there to pretty easily get a hard drive in there should we wish to or even two and we've got the rgb controller there, which is magnetic which is held in place all the other cables from the power supply tucked in between the actual power supply itself and the hard drive bay so yeah all in all it's a very tidy uh tidy little build so all I need to do now is to fire up and get some windows installed on it. So let's do that. But first of all, let's make sure it actually does power on. So there we go. We've got our full on rainbow puke going on there. Sorry if the camera looked a little bit weird there, but um, the assistant was kicking in and doing my head in. So I nearly threw my phone and also my watch. Anyway, there we go. Full on RGB rainbow puke. And actually it goes really nice with the RAM, considering at the moment there's no software installed whatsoever. This is literally just powered on self-test. And yeah, I think it actually looks good. I don't think I'll bother with uh, any RGB software. You can control the lights from the front, press the LED button. If you press and hold it, it then switches to motherboard mode, but obviously we're not connected to any uh, motherboard. So press it again, two seconds, and it goes back into the, uh, the carousel of different colors and shapes and sizes and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Anyway, I'm waffling. Let's get in Windows installed on this and see what it's actually like. Okay, so we're back and uh, we're kind of finished. Not entirely. This has been uh, a very trying build, let's say. So there's a few things which have gone wrong. 50-50, um, really. 
50% my fault, 50% hardware, probably. Let me explain. So when we started the build, you'd have probably remembered that we installed this little drive. This is the NVMe drive, which is the 240 or 256 gig, which is supposed to be in here. It was in there up until the point where the system wouldn't recognize it. At which point I realized that I am a bit of a dipstick and the Athlon processors with Vega graphics don't actually support NVMe M.2 drives. They support SATA M.2, but because of the limited PCI Express lanes, NVMe is not supported at all. Nothing, nada, not gonna happen. So at which point I was searching around, I'm sure I had a SSD based drive here somewhere. Ah, the Intenso drives. They were 512s, maybe we can squeeze that into the budget, but regardless, uh, I can't find one. So those seem to have all disappeared somewhere or other into systems, whatever. So that ruled that out. So the only other drive that I had left was the dreaded OCZ. I don't know why I just don't throw this thing in the bin. I think it's because I'm a little bit of a hoarder and I don't like throwing away things unnecessarily. But this drive has been the bane of my life for probably two or three years, if not more. Almost every machine I've put it into, it has failed at some stage, whether it's been day one, whether it's been month one, whether or not it's been year one. Every single system I've put it in, it has failed at some point. And I was trying to get ahead of the game. I have actually ordered a much, much more reliable drive. I ordered an A55 from Silicon Power. They're a 240 gig SSD, which, yeah, five year warranty. Those are great drives. They really are SLC cache, all that kind of stuff. So we got one of those on order. And I'm not just saying that because Silicon Power have been good to us and uh, sent us products to review in the past. I actually genuinely believe it. Silicon Power drives are pretty much flawless. I don't think I've had one fail ever. So I want to uh, keep it going that way. Obviously, this is going into a business environment, so I can't afford for it to go down for any reason. So hence why this thing, it did go in, did manage to get an install on there and actually done all the updates, got it all configured and everything. And it did what it did previously, where you'd run Windows for a certain amount of time, and all of a sudden it would just lose Windows, or you'd get memory errors coming up from some bizarre place. And it always seems to come down to that drive. So anyway, we did get Windows installed. We got Cinebench on there, so we did a couple of Cinebench runs, and I'll show you the temps and the scores on that now on screen. As you can see, temperature-wise, not too shabby at all. We've got minimum temperatures in somewhere around about the 25, 26 degrees mark on the CPU, which is absolutely brilliant. Obviously, the Arctic cooler is doing a fantastic job there. Peaked at about 52, 53 degrees, which, again, under full load, even though there's only two physical cores and four physical threads, or virtual threads, I guess you would call them, I don't think it's done too bad at all. And also, I was a little bit concerned about the VRM. Obviously, this is a low-end board, but actually, the VRM maxed out at pretty much the same temperature as the CPU, so no issues there. The actual VRMs on this can go up to kind of 95 to 100 degrees, you don't want them to, but uh, luckily they stayed around the 50 degrees mark, so we're absolutely fine there, as I would have thought with this kind of board. Looking at the graphical side of things, obviously uh, because it died a little bit, I've only done some limited testing, but we had a little blast on CSGO, and that was actually pretty enjoyable. We got around about sort of 45 frames per second as a pretty much a minimum, spiking up into the upper 60s, so totally playable. This is 1080p, we could have reduced settings down a little bit more to get a few more frames, but for what it is, Vega 3 graphics, it's absolutely fine for playing those kind of esports titles. And even saying that, CSGO these days actually seems to be getting harder and harder to run. The system hardware gets better and better, yet it doesn't seem to really move much. So, although people used to say, yes, you can run it on a potato, I think as the default settings, when you set it just to do auto, puts high textures and all that kind of stuff, it does actually take a little bit of grunt to run it. But anyway, I digress. So. Also, we tried a little bit of uh, Rocket League. Sadly, that is where the game ended for us, quite literally, as the drive just packed up and we had a blue screen of death, memory management error, and then I rebooted and it just basically wouldn't recognize the drive at all. So I figured, right, that's it. I'm gonna wave the white piece flag, I give up. I've had enough on this already. So we have got that new drive, which is gonna be delivered tomorrow, so we'll get that installed. Another fresh install of Windows, get all that done and dusted. I'm not gonna clone it, just in case there's any data corruption there. It just isn't worth it. So new drive in there tomorrow, get everything up to date. And uh, yeah, hopefully this is gonna be winging its way to the new owner. And actually looking at the PC itself, there's some B-roll you'll probably be seeing if you haven't already. I actually really like this little PC, I really do. 
The static control fans is excellent because you don't have to worry about anything, literally just connect up and they go. They're not overly noisy. In a busy kind of uh, business environment, it's gonna be absolutely fine. No one will notice it being on at all. Got nice lighting, obviously you can turn the lights off if you want to. That isn't an issue. And we've got a nice little bit of RGB from the RAM there as well, as you can possibly see. We've got the B-roll of that. The power supply cables I'm not overly keen with. I have gone to tang with them a little bit on a Sharpie. Do you wanna blacken them out a little bit and take away some of the glare? But I think it's absolutely fine. And actually one of the highlights, which I really was impressed with, was the uh, carbon fiber effect on the um, power supply there. I think that looks really, really good. Very impressed with that. And it's certainly kind of, it's a very discreet touch. It doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. It kind of mutes this area. So your eye is drawn more to the processor and the RAM and all that kind of stuff. And not looking at what writing's on the side of the power supply. I actually would hope that power supply basement cutouts would go. I would love them to be a thing in the past. Much rather see a solid sheet along there. You can actually even bring it out and just have the glass go in from there upwards, like a, quite a few cases do. I think that's a much nicer look. But for what it is, I think this actually works really well. So let's run through what our kind of expected prices are at the moment. You'll have to excuse me, I am going to look at the screen up there, so maybe you'll see some footage of gameplay while I'm running through this. So we've got the case itself at £30, we've got the motherboard at £20, the CPU at £40, I believe it was. This is subject to change. I'm taking it off the uh, the board as I've written on there, so it's kind of napkin math. Looking down at the RAM, we paid about 50 for that. PSU, uh, about 25, 30 pounds. Windows is gonna be a fiver from premiumcdkeys.com forward slash mics unboxing. Office is gonna be the similar sort of price, so not too much more, about 15 pounds in total for Office 2019 uh, Pro Plus version. And then we've got our new driver, which we just bought. So again, that's about another 30 pounds on top. So I'll round up the figures. Well, the time I've finished editing this video, the other driver had arrived and I'll have all the prices in front of me. So you'll see those on the screen, but that's the ballpark figures. So we're looking in the summer in the region of about 220, 230 pounds, give or take. Again, I do need to check out the prices to be sure on this. I think the processor might have cost a little bit more. I'll have to uh, dig out the receipts for that and see what it cost. But there we go. For under 250 pounds, we've got ourselves a nice little PC. Lots of upgrade spec. We can chuck another processor in there, stick a graphics card in there if you want to. It's got 16 gigs of RAM. Storage space is a little bit limited at 240 gigabytes, but you can pick up a one terabyte hard disk drive for about 20 quid these days. So you could quite easily stick one of those in for your Steam library or photo library, that kind of stuff. Very easy to do. And if you're using something like a NAS, then it's not gonna be a problem anyway. So let me know what you think about this one in the comments section below. Generally, overall, I'm actually very pleased with it. It's a shame that the drive went uh, that was not good at all, so yeah, it's been a long day, time to wrap this one up. So I've been Mike, this is Mike's Unboxing Reviews on How To, and hopefully we'll catch you guys in the very next video. Thanks for watching.